Let's open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. Um, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. And I, I'm going to be there pretty much 95% of the teaching is going to be in Mark 11. If you want to join us in Zechariah 9, I'm going to touch a verse in Zechariah 9. But for the most part, we will be in the Gospel of Mark chapter um, 11. It's really good to see you guys. I'm glad that... Uh, you're here. I'm, I'm positive we're going to come out of here blessed and, and encouraged um, by what we call the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ. Um, three weeks we'll be celebrating Easter Sunday. And um, that Friday before Easter um, at 7 p.m. we're going to have a, a service where um, it's going to be a Spanish service where we're going to touch on the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. Where when Jesus was on the cross, he shared seven, seven words. He said, had seven sayings. And so that Friday, good, what many call Good Friday, at 7 p.m., we're going to have a, a service where um, we're going to teach on um, all seven of those words. It'll be brief teaching, about five, five, six minutes on each word. I don't know um, the exact format, how we're going to do it, but, but um, it, it's going to be a good time, and I hope that you can make time to come out and be with us. Um, let's, and then, um, wait, so that's um, Friday the 17th, and then, um, I'm sorry, Friday the 15th. Friday, Sunday the 17th will be Easter Sunday. And this is your opportunity to be praying for your one, to invite your one, start sowing in them, getting them ready to come with you and join you here at church on Easter. I hope that you guys make time to come to me like, wow, oh, man, it's Easter. Let's hurry up. Let's go to the park, you know, before they get our spot. Like, no, no, no. Come to church. There'll be a space for you at the park, all right? Uh, if, if not, you can come to my house like that. We won't fit, but we'll come, right? <laughs> let's go ahead and let's pray. I mean, we prayed. I'm sorry. Let me, let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 11. Verse 1. Mark chapter 11, verse 1 says, As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Beth... I don't even know how you say this in, in English. Um, Bethph Bethphage? I don't know. And Bethany on the mount. I should have looked it up. And the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead. Verse 2. Go into that village over there, he told them. And as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. And as they um, were untying it, some bystanders demanded, hey, well, what are you doing untying that colt? Verse 6 says, they said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then... They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Some of your Bibles may say, Hosanna! Blessed Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. Right, let's, let's pause there. <clears throat> um, when, when Jesus uh, comes, we, we've spent several months studying the Gospel of Mark. And a couple of weeks ago, we um, talked about where Jesus asked his disciples, who do, who, who do they say I am? Right? And, and they're like, well, they think you're John the prophet. They think you're, you're, you're some prophet. And Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And they say, you're the Christ, right? And, um, and, and the, the disciples of Jesus have this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah. And what Christ, Messiah means, it means uh, Christ is a word that's used in the New Testament. Messiah is often used in the Old Testament. It, it means the anointed one. Like, like they're like, you're the anointed one. You're the one that we've been waiting for. Like you're the king, right, that you, we've been waiting for. And um, here is Jesus, but they call this the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. All of the Bible is pointing to this point in time where Jesus goes into Jerusalem to, to be crucified, to pay the price for our sins. And during this time, uh, there, there was a, a, a celebration happening in, in Jerusalem called Passover. And so during Passover, Jewish people from all over were coming in. And not only Jewish people from all over, but even uh, people that, that weren't Jews were coming in from other nations. They, they wanted to come and celebrate. They wanted to come and draw close to God. 
And, and remember that this whole time, the story of the Jewish people is that over and over, they have this story that repeats over and over, that they would be conquered by, by foreigners, they would be conquered by foreign nations, and, um, and they were always waiting for like this king, this Messiah that was going to come and free them. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the nation that had conquered them were the, was Rome. The Romans um, uh, ruled over them. And um, they uh, did not like the Romans, and most of the Romans did not like the Jews. And the whole time, the Jews, they're like, hey, the Hebrew people are like, one day the Messiah is coming. One day the king is going to come, and you're going to see. Right? Now, when I personally think about like a king coming in, this makes a sense, you know. Uh, we have a president here in our country, uh, President Biden. Like him, don't like him. Every president has people that like him and, and, and people that dislike him. Every president. And um, I, I know as you're watching your gas prices, you disliking him more and more. But anyways, every president, right? And uh, when a president goes, uh, especially to a city that overwhelmingly voted for him, from the moment that president arrives at the airport, there, the, people are already receiving him, right? People are excited as, he, as he's driving. Um, uh, uh, tell my mom I'll call her in a minute. No, no, my mom is here. It wasn't my mom then. And um, as, um, as the president is driving, people are already, they're waving flags. You know, they have signs that say, we love you, right? They have signs that say, go, president, go. In our case, it's, they say something else. But anyways, um, you know, they, they're excited. Well, this is something really similar in that the king has showed up. This is the, the one that the people are, they're excited for, and he shows up. Now, if you and I are writing the story, uh, Jesus would come like on, on this big horse, right? Like a war horse. Uh, last week, we had a guest speaker in all of the Spanish services. And um, on Sunday, the guest speaker's theme, or, or the, the title of his theme, was Rumors of War and the Steps of the Red Horse right? Um, the red horse representing war, right? So rumors of war and steps of the red horse because of what's happening in Ukraine. And, um, and when we think of like a king coming in to liberate, when we think of a king coming in to conquer, we imagine him on this horse, <clears throat> on a war horse, a horse prepared for battle. But Jesus and the kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of, the, of this world. Quite different. Instead of coming in on a war horse, he comes in on a, on a young donkey. He comes in on a colt, right? Uh, he comes in not in, in form of, I'm going to do war, but he comes in form of, I come in peace, right? And, and, and he comes and he conquers the hearts of men, not through battle, but through peace, through mercy, and through love, right? This is the way he operates. Verse 11 Oh, actually, let me share with you uh, something real quick. Uh, go, go back to, um, uh, let's, let's go back to verse 10. So he comes in. Now, um, I often share this, that every year I try and read my, um, my Bible from, from Genesis to, to Revelations. I have to read the Bible to prepare for messages, but just sit there and read, right? Like every year I'll, I'll, I'll just read it straight at least one time a year. I try and read it straight through. And one of my favorite things when we get to the New Testament, especially when I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and, and I mark it, like, like this Bible, I've, I've read it through a couple of times, and like almost every page is marked. And, and one of my favorite things to mark is when it says, it is written, right? You remember when the devil's tempting Jesus, and Jesus responds with, it is written, right? It is written. Because what that reminds us is that the ultimate, Old Testament it's constantly pointing to Jesus, right? You know, like when a crime happens here in, in um, like, let's say, like someone robbed a bank and for whatever reason, there wasn't a cameras or something, um, but there's witnesses and those eyewitnesses go with the police and the police bring a sketch artist and they'll draw like a sketch, right? And then the person will say like, you know, he had, you know, big eyes. He had a, a crooked nose, like it was broken. He had a long chin. He had curly hair, right? And so the guy, and then they'll show it to the public and be like, this, this is the person that, that we're looking for. Well, the Old Testament is sort of a sketch for the Messiah, for the Christ. 
so that when the Messiah, when the Christ would show up, we would be able to recognize him. Okay. Let, let me tell you, uh, years ago, my dad, he preached this message in Spanish. It was, uh, uh, I don't remember what the message was about, but uh, the title always stuck with me. It was called Los Uvo, Los Ay, Los Abran, right? Which means that there were some, there are some, and there will always be some, right? And, and let me tell you, I don't, I don't remember what that message was about, just remember the title. But there have always been, and there are, and there will always be weirdos. Weirdos. You, you know what a weirdo is? You probably don't because maybe you're it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right? Like that. No, you're not a weirdo. I'm just kidding. Don't leave church all offended. The person sitting next to you is the weird one. You, you're normal, right? The, the, there's always like, you know, that, that they think like, man, maybe I'm the Messiah, right? Like there, there are people that think they're the Messiah. Uh, you know, uh, here in Texas, there's a famous town called Waco, Texas. And, and there was a man in Waco by the name of David Koresh. And David Koresh convinced his followers that he was, the, he was the Messiah, right? And so the Old Testament is always showing us like, look, no, 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 no. This is the sketch, right? When the Messiah comes, he's got to fulfill these things, right? So why would Jesus come on this young colt, on this young donkey? Because he's fulfilling scripture. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding, not on a war horse, but riding a what? On a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt, right? You know, so, he, so he's, he's fulfilling this, right? Maybe there's someone present today that's like, you know, I, I think I might be the Messiah, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe we've got an oddball. Well, you know, let, let me ask, where were you born? Well, I was born in Pasa, get down Dina, but man, I'm sorry. See, the, the sketch is that the Messiah would be born in the city of David in Berlin, right? Bethlehem. And so, so there's, there's a sketch of what the Messiah must look like. Let me tell you that when Jesus came, there are dozens and dozens of prophecies about the Messiah, about the Christ. Jesus fulfilled every single one of them so that we can walk not in doubt, but in true faith, knowing that truly Jesus is the anointed one, our King who has come to save us. All right? Now, amen. If we're going to praise God, let's praise God. If it's for me, stop. But if it's for the Lord, let's praise the Lord. Let's, let's go back to Mark chapter 11. Right? Today, I'm going to talk to you about three things. Okay? I'm going to talk to you about the temple. I'm going to talk to you about a fig tree. Right? And then the third thing, before I tell you the third thing I'm going to talk to you, let me tell you something that happened is that this guy was passing by and someone was like, hey man, come in, come in. And he's like, come into church, come into church. And he's like, what, what, what's up with that? And they're like, man, they're talking about Jesus. And he goes, mm, they're talking about Jesus. What are they gonna say about me? You know, like that. So some of you get it, some of you don't. But anyway, you'll get it later tonight. And so I, I'm gonna talk about you, all right? We're gonna talk about the temple. We're gonna talk about a fig tree. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it back to you, right? I'm gonna bring it to us. Verse 11 says, so Jesus came to Jerusalem and went to the temple. After looking around carefully, notice that, after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. This is like saying Jesus arrived at Houston and then he went and spent the night in Pasadena, right? This is the same thing. Okay, now let's jump to verse uh, 15. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. 17. He said to them, the scriptures declare, he, he's saying to them, some of your Bibles may say, he said to them, is it not written? Or it is written, Right? My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Let's all read that part together. My temple will be called a what? The house of prayer for who? Again, my temple will be called a house of prayer for who? For all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. 
When the leading priests, verse 18, and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning on how to kill them, but they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teachings. Verse 17, again. Jesus tells them, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So, Jesus goes to Jerusalem, rides in on that colt. They take him to the temple. He looks around carefully, sees everything. He leaves. Then the next day he returns, starts flipping tables. He's mad, flipping tables. Starts kicking people out, stopping them from selling things. And then he tells them, it is written, right? The sketch has been drawn. It is written, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, right? Now, for the Jews, there were two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, right? Jews and Gentiles. So it doesn't matter if you're Latino, you're Hispanic, you're African, you're uh, uh, American, you're European, you're Asian. For them, it's the Jews and Gentiles, right? It's Africans, Gentiles, Latinos, Gentiles, you know, everybody, so it's Jews and Gentiles. And where Jesus arrives at the entrance of the temple, when he first gets there, this is sort of like saying like the parking lot of the church, right? So Jesus arrives and man, there's all this movement. There's a lot of stuff going on. There are thousands of people there to worship and celebrate Passover. They're selling and buying doves, selling and buying sheep, lambs to sacrifice. Um, and on top of that, Gentiles, people from other nations have showed up because they want to also be a part of, of, of worship, worshiping God. And, and, and Jesus comes and he's like, man, this, this is crazy. This is insane. There's a famous historian by the name of Josephus, a, a famous Jewish historian. And Josephus says, that at times they had up to 255,000 sheep, 255,000 sheep that they were sacrificing. Can you imagine the ruckus of 255,000 sheep coming in, being sold, being bought, being sacrificed, people selling other animals such as doves that were also sacrificed, Others are saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You remember that story whenever uh, someone asked Jesus, like, hey, and I, I laugh about this because we're, we're in April and um, it's tax season. So they asked Jesus, uh, hey, um, is, it, is it correct to pay taxes? And, and you, know, you know this story? Anybody know this story? Jesus says, bring me a coin, bring me a coin. And, and so they bring a coin. If it would have been me, I would have been like, bring me, bring me a coin, bring me a coin. And then, you know, they bring me a coin, I put it in my pocket, bring me another coin, bring me another coin like that. But, but anyways, I'm not Jesus. So, so Jesus is like, bring a coin, bring a coin, right? And then he says, whose image is on it? Right? And someone says, Caesar. And then he says, render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's and give to God what is God, right? So uh, April, we're, we're, I don't know where we're, we're really stepped up, but uh, is that April 15th? Uh, when, when, is, when is tax day? April 15th, right? April 15th, render unto Uncle Sam what belongs to Uncle Sam, all right? And then give to the Lord what is to the Lord, right? And so, anyways, their coins had an image, right? And for the Jews, like, they were not going to allow an image in the temple because that's idolatry. So you couldn't buy a lamb, a sheep, or you couldn't buy a dove with Roman money, you had to use temple money. And so there were money changers, right? But you know how it is when La Raza gets involved, you know? Where normally a sheep costs $200, but since Christmas is coming and everybody wants one, right? Para, para, para la birria, right? <laughs> you know? So, you know, Passover, I don't know how much a, a sheep costs for, you know, before Passover, let's say $200, but it's Passover, everybody's coming to sacrifice. And, you know, normally we exchange uh, a Roman <coughs> dollar for a temple dollar, but being how everybody's coming, two Roman temples, two Roman dollars for one temple dollar, right? Got to make some money, you know? And, 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 this was, and so Jesus pulls up on that scene. All the ruckus of animals coming, people changing. And Jesus is like, man, it's written, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Right? 
Now, on top of all of this, right, Jesus is uh, once again going back to the sketch. In, in, in the, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, Isaiah had already given a sketch, and he said, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem. I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus is like, look, man, all of this stuff is already written, and you guys are doing opposite of what's written. And so he gets mad, and he begins to clean house. Because can you imagine... Brother, let, let me ask, is there anybody first time at church today? Anybody? No? Okay. Oh, you guys. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, but y'all been to church, right? This is not your first time. Anybody here that's your first time ever in a church? No, we live in Texas. Claro que no. Right? <laughs> like that. Can you imagine, like, well, if it's your first time at church, you don't, you don't know, like, other than what you see online or something, right? So you kind of show up, you're a little like, or are they nice? Like, is it going to be hot? Is it going to be cold? Um, like, you have all of these reservations, right? You know, like, man, are they weird? You know, and then Pastor mentioned that there were weird people here. And, I, and so, right, all of these things, like, oh, like, uh, you know, like, it, it's, there's an awkward feeling, right? Is that when you go anywhere new, it's like going to a new restaurant, right? Like, uh, especially if, you know, you're used to tacos and someone invites you to go eat Indian food. You're like, like, you know, well, I, I, I took some, I, I like to take pastors out to eat. I like to be a blessing to them. And, and I, I took a pastor and a, a mutual friend out to eat. And we ate seafood in Galveston. And after we ate seafood in Galveston, um, they, they bring this little cup with warm water and lemon. Anybody ever seen that after you eat seafood? Yeah. Um, if you've never seen that, look, I'll tell you where to go so you can, so you can experience this, all right? But you're going to spend some money. There's a restaurant called Gaido's in, um, in Galveston, all right? Take your wife to Gaido's, all right? Pastor Ruben recommended it, all right? Just save up for it. And um, after you eat, they're going to bring you a little cup of warm water with lemon in it. And so I told my friend, his name is Abraham. I'm like, Abraham, just add a little bit of salt and then go ahead and drink it. And he's like, look at me. And I, it, no, it's not for that. It's so that you can stick your fingers in it to kill like el peste, the smell of like the shrimp and the fish and all that. But I, but I told my friend, I go, and, and the pastor told him, or you can add sugar if you like it sweet, you know, like that. And we were, you know, don't, 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 don't do that. If you go to Guido's, don't do that. But you see, if you don't know, you're kind of like, pues esto que es, right? You know, like, as we like to say every time we go somewhere new, esto no tenemos en mi rancho, right? You know, like, like we always say that, right? You got to say that. And so, um, so anyway, so, you know, you come to church for the first time, you don't know what to expect. You know, even if, even if you've gone to church and you're at a new church, like, you really don't know what to expect. Now, can you imagine these Gentiles, they're like coming to the temple, to pray, my house shall be called a house of prayer, right? That's what Jesus said back in verse 17. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So the Gentiles, the Jews, they're used to it. This is generations. But now the, the Gentiles are arriving and they're like, what in the world? You know, over 255,000 sheep coming in and out, vendiendo doves. Ranking, oh, no, no, you can't use, what, where are you from, United States? No, no, Benjamin Franklin ain't good here. You got to change money with us if you want to buy a, 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 a lamb to sacrifice for your family, right? All of these things, and, and Jesus gets mad and avared, cleans house, starts throwing tables, starts kicking people out, stopping them from selling. It's not no marketplace, and, and he cleans house. And you see, the Jews thought that Jesus was going to come and clean house, as in get the Gentiles out. But instead, Jesus showed up and cleansed house so that the Gentiles could come in. How are you going to pray with all of this stuff going on? My house shall be called a house of prayer. How are you going to pray? And so Jesus is like, no, 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 this, this, this doesn't work like that. Okay. Now, in our minds, we're going to go way back. To Genesis. And in Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve, and he gives them one rule, one, one command. Don't eat from the tree of wisdom of good and evil. That's the only command. You see that tree? Don't eat it. Don't eat from that tree. Right? Of course, Mama Eva extends her hand, eats, turns around, gives it to Adam. Adam eats, and immediately something happens. They see that they're naked. 
So they get some leaves, they try and cover themselves. Then God comes to spend time with them in the cool of the air, in the cool of the afternoon, is what the Bible says. And when they heard God come in, they hid themselves. And God's like, Adam, Eve, where are you? He knew what was up, but he, you know, this is for us to learn. So he says, where are you? And they're like, we're, we're hiding, we're naked. And he goes, who told you you're naked? You disobeyed. And then God does something. He covers them with skins, all right? Now remember, the Old Testament is that sketch pointing to Jesus. He covers them with skins. Innocent animals had to die, shed blood, to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. Jesus, the innocent one, comes and dies to cover our sins. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, right? Is what it says in the Gospel of St. John. And then God says, get them out. So they kick them out of the garden. And at the entrance of the garden, they put a, a, a cherubim, right, a, an angel, and they put a flaming sword right, that would move back and forth. In other words, God was saying, I'm holy, and you're filled with sin, and if you want to come to my presence, you must pass through the judgment, right, through that flaming sword. Okay. Now, everybody here, everyone here has been offended. At one point in your life, you've been offended. And everyone here has offended someone, right? So that's not a big deal. We're always crying that we're offended. Tú también, right? Tú también, right? You know, we have all offended someone, okay? Now, there are some offenses that as your pastor, mi consejo, my advice is forget about it. Right? Just pick up your toys and move on. Rebecca Rose, a couple of months, I started um, school, and uh, one day I uh, pick her up, and, and she's all, you know, long face, as, as we uh, say around here, and I'm like, what's wrong, mija? And so a little girl in her class, like, took a toy from her and didn't want to play with her, and so I told her, I'm like, look, when you go to school, and you go play with the kids, if someone's being mean to you, you're going to say, hey, you're being mean, you're being rude, I'm not gonna play with you, walk away and go play with other kids, right? And so I'm drilling this in her all morning, and we're driving to school, and I'm like, what are you gonna tell the kid if, if they're being mean to you? And she goes, I'm gonna tell them you're being naughty, I'm not gonna play with you, and I'm gonna go play with someone else. Okay, so, right. So then, you know, a couple of days later, she comes and, 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 and the, the, the same li li little uh, girl pushed her right? And now we have a problem. No, I'm just kidding. I'm like, well, Mika, it's the same thing. She's being rude. She's being mean. Don't play. Just forget about it. The little kids, that's what they do. I'm pretty sure that Rebecca's taking a toy from her, right? I'm pretty sure that Rebecca at one point was being naughty, as Rebecca likes to say, with, with, with her, right? So I'm like, forget about it. This is the little kid stuff, right? But there are some offenses that are so great, so harsh, that a simple forget about it, uh-uh-uh, this demands justice, right? Call the police, call the law, right? Call the attorney, right? This demands justice, you know what I mean? Like abuses, ab child abuse, uh, uh, you know, rapes, you know, these type of things, you know, demand justice, right? Well, God is holy, all sin, God demands justice. Because God is holy, that disobedience of Adam and Eve, of Eden, of the tree of wisdom, of good and evil, God's like, uh-uh, this is a sword. You want to come to my presence, you have to pass through the sword. Right? Well, later, God chooses a man by the name of Abraham. And he chooses the descendants of Abraham, his son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob, and then Jacob's 12 sons, which we call the 12 tribes of Israel. And God says, man, we're going to start all over with these guys. And he, and he gives them the plan to build what we call the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is basically like the temple, but the temple was fixed. It was fixed in Jerusalem. The tabernacle moved around. It was like a tent, and they would pack it and unpack it and move it around. And in the tabernacle, in the temple, there was a special place called the Holy of Holies. Right? This is the most holiest place on earth. It's where the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God would manifest itself. And one time... Per year, one man, known as the high priest, could enter, he would pass this veil, and enter on the Day of Atonement into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, 
and offer a sacrifice for all of Israel. And when he come in, he would have to come in with, with blood because God demands what? Judgment. And he would bring blood. He would bring a sacrifice before God and then God would uh, atone the sins for his people for one year and the following year they would do that again. Okay. All of this is pointing to Jesus. Because remember, and my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. That was Adam and Eve. That was the Jews. But what about us? You see, we have always been on the outside looking in. Right? We've always been separate. Look at it. Like we want to be a part, but but we weren't we weren't part of what was going on. We didn't have promise. Right? And through Jesus. That veil that separated the Holy of Holies from everything else was torn, and now you and I have access to God, to the presence of God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, because through Jesus, you are a son, you are a daughter of adoption, right? You were adopted, okay? So um, uh, please pray for my lovely wife, uh, April... Uh, late April is, is, seems to be the, 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 the due date um, of, of, of when, Lord willing, Rubencito gets here. And, it, and if it's not Rubencito, if it's Rubencita, we're not going to tell her we were praying for a boy. Nobody say anything. We just, you know, play it cool. But anyways, uh, um, the first, so it makes us think about, you know, when Rebecca was born, when Raquel was born. But when Rebecca was born, we didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. Same thing as with this baby. And um, it was this whole ordeal. We went to the hospital uh, Monday, like at midnight, right? So really Tuesday night, uh, Tuesday early morning. And we were there from like Monday all the way to Friday. The baby was born, right? Thursday or Friday. And it was, I mean, they induced one day, nothing happened. They induced the other day, nothing happened. The next day, the water broke, and then the baby wouldn't come out. The doctor never even showed us. It was a horrible experience. This doctor we didn't even know just pops in his head, and he goes, you don't know me, I don't know you, but I'm going to tell you what you don't want to hear. We need to do a C-section. And we were like, okay. Then he walked out. <laughs> we were just like, what in the world? And um, so anyway, so all the nurses, all the, all the staff, they're like, it's a boy. I mean, Mira, look at all the problems he's given. They, for sure, it's a boy, right? They, they were, and the doctor was the only one saying that, no, it's a girl. And so I'll never forget, we were, I was in the operating room, and they take out Rebecca, and the doctor says real loud, he's like, I knew it. He goes, it's a girl. And then his voice changes, and he goes, and it's a big girl, <laughs> right? Like that, right? So, you know, they clean her up. They're like, dad, dad, you know, and they, they, they put her in my arms. They put my toddler in my arms, right? You know, and... <laughs> And so, so I'm carrying her, and she's crying, right? She's crying. I'm like, shh, don't, 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 don't cry. No, I'm just kidding, right? She, she's crying, like normal, right? She's crying. And man, you know how parents are. In me, I mean, in seconds, that, that her little cry is recorded in my ear, right? So they take me and Rebecca out of the uh, 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 room where they did the surgery, and they're still with Nayeli. And the, they say, Dad, we're going to take the baby over there. You cannot go over there because there's other families. You need to have respect for the family. But she's going to be okay. We're going to take her over there. And of all the babies crying, man, my ear was like tuned to Rebecca. Like I could tell that's Rebecca crying, right? And I'll never forget, like Nayeli finally came out of the room. And, and she's like in a daze. And she's like, where's the baby? And, and I was like, they have her over there. And, and then all of a sudden, like, Wah. and I'm like, that, that's her. That's Rebecca. Like I know the, the cry. Like that's, that's my baby. Like that. And then from there, they take Rebecca to the, what do we call it, the nursery, right? The, the nursery where they have like all the babies and, and you look through the window, right? And, and you see like all these babies. And there was this little baby there, so cute. I mean, she was so beautiful, this baby there. And I, I, I asked the nurse, I'm like, will you switch? I'm just kidding. I did not say that. I did not say that. I just want to see if you're paying attention. Hello, like, my baby was a cute one. Come on, man. And so anyways, I didn't pick her. But as uh, someone said a long time ago, no es la que yo pedí, pero el Señor me la dio. Right? You know, like, <laughs> you know. But, but, I, but I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't pick her. And you guys know, and maybe some of you lived this. There are blood parents that abandon their children. There are blood parents that abandon their children. There, there, there's people that might even be present here that your mother or your father uh, abandoned you. That happens. Right? 
But when we talk about adoption, you don't choose to be adopted. The parent chooses the child that they're going to adopt. And even though, as the old saying is, blood is thicker than water, even though there's a, a compromiso, a commitment between a, a blood parent and, and, and their children, a father and his children, a mother and her children, there's a whole different type of commitment between a father or a mother who decides to adopt someone. There's a whole other commitment. You can't just walk away from that. You can't just walk away from that because you chose that child. God has chosen you. My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's you. That's us. And, and those who have gone through the process of adoption will tell you that it's a long process and it's expensive. It's a long process and it's expensive. Right? The process to adopt you, the process to adopt me, that we would become part of the family of God was a long process since Adam and Eve all the way to the birth of Jesus, all the way to his death and resurrection, and then all the way to us, a long process, and it was expensive. God didn't pay in Benjamins. God didn't pay in Bitcoin. God didn't pay in silver and gold. He didn't pay in diamonds. He paid with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. God himself shed blood to, so that you could be adopted and become part of the family. Jesus went through the judgment. When Jesus was crucified, he went through that sword that stopped Adam and Eve from returning to the presence of God. Jesus went through it. He died for us. And when Jesus died for us, that bell that separated the holy from holies from everything else was torn from top to bottom. They say the bell was so thick and so strong that they would tie it to four ox and four ox couldn't tear it. Yet when Jesus was crucified, so that you and I could have access to the presence of God. Okay. Now we read verse 11. And then we jumped to verse 15. So there's some verses in between. Let's read those verses. Verse 12. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Now, let's pause there. Right? The, Jesus curses this fig tree. Last year during um, uh, Holy Week, a uh, friend of mine, is, is an interesting story. Um, uh, he's a well-known businessman here in the community of, of Pasadena. And my dad and his father, um, through the, because of the church, would do business and now me and him, you know, now the sons are, are doing um, uh, work together and we do business through the, through the church. And um, so last year during Holy Week, he called me. He's like, Pastor Ruben, will you come and do a Bible study for my workers? And I was like, yeah. So I went over and we went to the conference room and um, he's like, sit right here, sit right here. So, so I sat down and all his workers were in there. And I noticed on my left hand side, there were three pots with um, fig trees, right? And, and I recognize fig trees because I have a fig tree in my backyard. And so after I taught, he's like, hey, will you teach us what's up with, with the whole fig tree? And, uh, you know, why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Now, this story that we just read from verse 12 to verse 14, it, it's sort of a metaphor. Right? Remember, verse 11, we're at the temple. Jesus leaves. Verse 15, Jesus returns back to Jerusalem, returns back to the temple. Right? What's up with the fig tree? From far, the fig tree looked good. Had a trunk, had limbs, had leaves. Looked good. Jesus was hungry. But when he approached, when he drew near, when he came closer in observation, what did he find? It was fruitless, no fruit. Right? 
no fruit. It looked good from far, bacha, but when he got closer, uh uh, no good. Remember the whole temple situation? That, that Jesus went, what we read in, in verse 11, Jesus went to the temple and he saw everything. Right? He saw everything that was going to, like the temple from far looked good. People were at the temple. Jews were at the temple. Gentiles were showing up to the temple. Sheep, and doves, or clean animals are coming to be sacrificed. Uh, sacrifices are occurring at the temple. The Levites were there attending and taking care of the temple. The priests were there taking care of it and attending the people and, and offering sacrifices. It looked good, but when Jesus came closer, it was fruitless. There is no fruit. Instead, he began to drive out people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And what does he tell them? You've turned this house of prayer into a den of thieves, right? into a cave of thieves. Right? Look good, but upon closer inspection, no bueno. And if we're not careful, the same is true for the church. A church from far can look good. People are showing up for praise and worship. The music was awesome. The preacher, he made us laugh or he made us cry. You know, man, they, they have a nice sound system. They have a nice, uh, you know, screens. They have um, a program for the young kids. They have programs for the old kids. They have programs for, for you know, this and for that. And, and, and we start depending on programs and we start depending on this and that. But a clown, upon closer inspection, it may look good, but it's more of a country club than it is a church. It's more of an association or a country club than it is a house of prayer. It's become more of a community center than a place that exalts the name of Jesus. Right? And we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't depend so much on programs to change our lives as opposed to depending on the power of the Holy Spirit to do a work, to transform us, to heal us, to strengthen us, to fill us with His peace, with His grace, with His favor, and with His mercy. In Revelations, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. In the last church, to the church, you know what Jesus tells them? I'm on the outside, knocking. It's church, y'all. <laughs> it's church, y'all. And Jesus is not in being worshiped. Instead, he's out asking to come in. That fig tree from far looked good, but upon closer inspection, it didn't have fruit. The temple from far looked good, but upon closer inspection, it was a, 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 a den of thieves. A cave of thieves is how it says in Spanish. The church from far can look good. The pastor is known in the community. The church is well known in the community. But upon closer inspection, I chisme. There's gossip, there's slander, there's division, there's uh, uh, groups of these guys and those guys, and, and you can't come and sit with us. Remind me of Forrest Gump whenever he gets in the bus and he's going to sit down and those kids put their hands like, you know. Where's the fruit, y'all? We letting the Holy Spirit produce fruit or not? I told you I was going to talk about the temple, fig tree, and I'm talking about you, and I'm going to talk about you. Because some of you, I'm going to say better yet, some of us, from far we look good. What we post on Facebook, what we post on Instagram, looks good. A ver, tomeme un foto. Tomame otra. Right, take, take another and, uh, no, from the left, the left is my side, and a little bit angle, so I can a little bit slimmer. Like 
Oh man, on, on social media, man, we only put the best, the nicest, what, whatever you know, seems the coolest. That's what we put. But upon closer inspection, when the one who sees all and knows all, come, let, me, let me tell you, you can fool your pastor and your pastor can fool you. This happens all the time. You can fool your pastor and your pastor can fool you. But we cannot fool he who knows all and sees all. No? We cannot fool him. The Bible says this, don't be fooled, God will not be mocked. Right? Don't be fooled, God. In other words, don't you play games with God. Don't you play games with God. Verse 18 says, when the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning on how to kill him. Let me tell you that when you and I are confronted with the king, we either choose to reject him or we choose to serve him. There's no in between. You must choose to reject him or choose. The, the, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law understood Jesus is the king. We must make a decision. They chose to reject him. You must choose to either reject him or serve him. There's nothing in the middle. Like these people that say like, well, you know, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Eh, you done rejected the gift. Well, you know, I mean, I do kind of believe in Jesus and the church, but I also believe that, that there are other ways, you know. Man, there are other ways. Why would Jesus come and suffer everything he did? So that then he could be like, well, you can believe in me, or if you want, you can also believe over there in that way. That makes no sense. Ah, you choose to reject him. Choose wisely, my friend. Choose wisely. Because eternity is what we are dealing with. Eternity is what we are dealing with. A couple of days ago, I think it was Thursday, I was walking through the parking lot and this young girl was like, Pastor Ruby? I'm like, yeah. She was like, can I go into church and pray? Oh, it's closed. I go, I'll go with you. And we came, we sat down here at this bench and we were talking and um, she was telling me she's dealing with a lot of anxiety. Um, I'm like, well, what, what, what triggers anxiety? And she was telling me that her grandma, in the last two years, she lost her grandma and she lost her cousin. And I told her, I'm like, you know, mija, I'm going to pray for you, and I believe that God can heal you from anxiety, but more important of healing you from anxiety is that you would allow God to save you. Because, because anxiety just lasts right now. Salvation is eternal. Right? And as we see, as she saw, death doesn't respect age. Her grandma, who was significantly older than her, had passed away, and her cousin, who was about her age, had passed away. So I can't even tell her how long she would be healed from anxiety. But salvation is eternal, right? is eternal. Jesus asked his disciples, who do they say I am? And then he asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Right? This afternoon, you and I were confronted with the king. Will you reject or will you receive? Will you reject or will you receive and submit to him? God is holding a gift. Right? He's holding the gift of salvation. And he's asking you, will you re receive it or will you reject it? Uh, last week I, I shared with those of you who came about different camps where the spirit of Eve, where the, a spirit of uh, hatred is moving, right? Talk about how the spirit of hatred is moving through social media. And, and, and I shared with you guys about how the spirit of hatred is, is moving on online gaming, right? And, and I talked a little bit about, you know, the bullying that happens on online gaming. And, um, and I tell you, it was just amazing to me how all the young kids who do online gaming were just looking at me like, like how does pastor know, right? You know, because I said that your kids are being bullied and if your kids are not being bullied, they are the bully, right? You know, it's just like I said earlier, you know, the person next to you is weird. And if they're not weird, then it's you who's weird, right? But, and, um, but you know, you, you go to school and, um, and, and, and you know, that's a big thing these days, you know, bullying in, in school, right? And so, you know, imagine this, this girl, freshman, first year of school, 14 years old, first day of school, 
goes through the lunch line, she don't know nobody, she has her lunch plate with a burrito and french fries and you know, her iced tea. And, and she comes out and she, and she sees these girls sitting over there and she looks at them and one of the girls looks at her and says, And she's like kind of like walking, like trying to figure out. And then I, I used to little Forrest Gump, like another girl puts her hand on the seat, like, you know, sit with those like that. Okay. That's cool, man. There's a lot of bullying happening. Right? But you see that girl, she's 14, and, 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 and you know, uh, about halfway through the school year, around uh, the end of uh, first semester, her parents are going to have a quinceanera for her. And man, the rumors out there that her parents are rich and they're bringing in some big time famous artist. And, and now all these girls that were like, not here, they all want to come to the quinceanera. And, 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 and man, the, her parents, you know, man, they, they sent off to, to get the invitation. I am Monterrey because that's where the best stuff is, right? You know, and, and they bring, you know, the, the invitation for the quinceanera and, 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 and she's at school and, and these girls that bully, you, you think that she's going to go to them and be like, hey, I know you didn't let me sit with you at the table, but I would like to invite you to my quinceanera, this big time artist. You think that that happened? Like, hey, 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 let me sit at your table. I don't want you my quinceanera. Let me tell you what happens, man. Those type of quinceañeras, somebody always crash in those quinceañeras. People that weren't invited always show up. Pueblo's Church, don't go where nobody invited you. They didn't invite you, don't go. Right? Pueblo's Church, they didn't invite you, don't go. And I'm going to give you another piece of advice. Nothing to do with my teaching, but free advice. Don't get offended when they don't invite you. These people get offended. They didn't get invited. Don't get offended when they don't invite you. As a matter of fact, be thankful because you didn't have to buy a gift. All right? So be thankful. But anyways... So imagine that the bullies show up to the quinceanera, you know, because, you know, this big time artist is going to be there and they're going to have all these gifts, you know, and, and, you know, these giveaway bags for all the guests and stuff like that. And imagine that they show up, you know, they're all glammed out and they show up. But at the door, who, who's at the door? Security. And he's like, it's invitation only. Right? Where's y'all's invitation? And they're like, well, we go to school with her, we know her. And it happens that the quinceanera sees them. And she's with her dad. And she tells her dad, esas son right? las bullies. You, you, you think the dad's going to be like, oh, come on in, girls. You are so mean to my daughter. Well, here's the special seat for you. No, we want something in the Better hope that don't happen at my No, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> Mika's not getting no quinceanera. I'd rather buy her a car than give her a quinceanera. Anyways, personal preferences. But um, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm saying? Well, let me tell you that we're not talking about a little girl and we're talking about a quinceanera. We're talking about the Son of God. Right? And we're talking about heaven. Right? And God the Father is extending to you an invitation to spend eternity with him. Right? But for you to spend eternity with him, you must receive that invitation. You must receive the son. To receive the son is to receive the father. But to reject the son is to reject the father. To receive the son is to receive the father, is to receive heaven, is to receive eternal life. But to reject is to spend eternity in hell. You pick, you choose. Because one day, you and I will not open up our eyes to this world. Amen. One day we will open them in a different world. And you will either open your eyes in what we call hell, or you will open them in heaven. There's no in between. Will you choose heaven? Will you choose heaven? Choose wise, my friend. And for you to choose heaven, you must choose the only way to heaven. And I finish with the words of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. No religion, no philosophy, no, okay, I'm spiritual. 
No, okay, I'm a member of this church or, you know, my parents were pastors. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is that your son, that your name is written in the book of life. And for your name to be written in the book of life, you must submit to the king who is the author of the book of life. And his name is Jesus Christ. Let's praise him. As we prepare to finish this afternoon, I want to invite you to close your Bibles, if you have your Bible, and let's bow our heads for a little bit. And will you thank the Father? Thank the Father that you're here at church. Just, just thank Him that you came to church today. Say, say God, I, I thank you that I'm here at church. Lord, I thank you that, that I came to Pueblo's church this afternoon. Father, I thank you that the hermanos are here. I'm here with, with, with other believers, and we worship you, and we spend time studying your word. If your family is here with you, give God thanks to your family. That's a tremendous blessing. Father, I thank you that my wife is here, my niece is here, my mother is here, my father was at an earlier service, my sister-in-law was at an earlier service. I thank you, Father. Will you thank the Father that he's here? Will you say, God, thank you that you're here? Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is always with us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Gracias. Thank you. Today you're confronted with the king. Will you submit to him or will you reject him? Today the king has called you out. He knows that you're like the temple, you're like the fig tree. From far you look good, but upon closer inspection, we're not right with the Lord. You're here out of pure mercy and out of pure love that your heavenly Father wants you to leave here with the confianza, with the assurance that if you were to close your eyes to this world, you would open them in His presence. Will you receive the invitation? Will you receive the king? Will you receive the anointed one? Right now he comes in peace on a young colt. But next time he'll come ready for battle to judge the nations. Arimate, get close to him right now that he's here in peace so that you can spend eternity on his side. If today you say, Pastor, I need Jesus, I don't care how many times you've risen your hand. If today you say, I need Jesus, will you do me a favor, just raise your hand and then you can put it down. I see you on my left, God bless you. I see you in the balcony, God bless you. Here in the middle, in front, in the back, God bless you. I see you here on my right hand side, God bless you. Let me tell you, it's not that I see you, God sees you. And he sees that step of faith that you take in saying, I need Jesus. I wanna invite everyone, let's confess our faith together this afternoon. Everyone, let's repeat this prayer. Say, Father God, thank you that I came to church. Thank you for the teaching of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart. Your son, Jesus Christ, he is Lord, Master, King of the universe, of this world, and now of my life. And I believe with all my heart, he came to this world. He was crucified and buried, but three days later, you resurrected him. And because I confess and believe this, you promised me salvation. And with salvation, you promised me a new life, abundant life, and eternal life. I receive it in Jesus' name. Say, say, I receive it in Jesus' name. I receive new life in Jesus' name. I receive abundant life in Jesus' name. I receive eternal life in Jesus' name. I receive the promises that you have for me. Tell Father, say, I receive the promises you have for me and the promises that you have for my family. Let me pray for you. Father, I, I thank you for Pueblo's church as that your grace, your favor, your mercy would be over them. Many today, Father, they put their faith in your son Jesus. They've chosen to receive him and to submit themselves to him. And I ask, Father, that you would guide their steps, bless whatever they put their hands to, 
and that your name would be honored and glorified in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord.